Good morning. I found out that Connor and I had something in common today. We both have colds. So, but he could, uh, he could pass on his responsibility to somebody else. <laughs> but I don't know, unless Nick wants to preach. I guess you're stuck with me. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the gift of eternal life we have through his atoning death for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you that by your mercy you brought us through another year. It is only by your grace that you'll bring us through the next year. Some of us had really great years, really things to rejoice. Some of us had difficult years. We may have lost loved ones, may have been sick. But Lord, we know that you will undertake for us no matter what our need, by your grace and by your mercy. Lord, we want to offer up this service today as as an offering of our praise and worship to you because you are worthy of all of our worship. We, Lord, we pray for those that have special needs today. We may not even know them, but uh, you do. And we, pray, and we uplift each one that you may be sufficient for them, whatever their circumstance. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I think I'm supposed to dismiss the children, aren't I? Uh, there's children's church, I think, so... If there's children that need to be dismissed, they may go. <laughs> um, my last church, I was, it seemed like when that happened, about half the, the congregation left. So <laughs> I don't know if they're all children or not. But, <laughs> so. The year 2021 is over. We can't repeat it. (laughs) Now, for Carol and I, it it marked uh, 50 years of marriage. That was the beginning. But if you think about it, for over 800,000 American people, their families, it marked the death of a loved one due to COVID. And all of us experienced really happy times as well as difficult ones. So for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, 2022 is here. We have no idea what will transpire in this new year. But we can anticipate that like every other year, it will be a mixed bag, right? Um, Often at the beginning of a new year, we reflect on the last year and we think about what we would like to do in the new year. I don't know if you've thought about that, but we have. Carol and I really want to go to Japan because we have a granddaughter that's four years old we haven't seen her for two years. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, we do want to see their, her parents too, but uh, <laughs> especially that little girl. And uh, on my bucket list is a trip to the Canadian Rockies while I'm still able to hike the trails. Now, Carol thinks a trip to Florida in February would be pretty good. But I'm sure you have some aspirations for this next year, too. But whether or not we're able to complete that bucket list is really not important from an eternal viewpoint. It doesn't matter whether I ever get to see the Canadian Rockies. 50 years from now, well, 40 years from now, I figure this out, it won't matter to me at all. 
What is important is whether we do what God wants us to do in the new year. And I think there's texts we have this morning will can help us with this. But before we unpack these verses, we need to set them in their context. Paul was writing this letter to the Thessalonians from Corinth. As Pastor Ty has explained to us, Paul's concern was that these new believers live holy lives, submitting every area of life to God. So as he finished this letter, he laid out some final instructions. In verses 12 through 14, it was to the congregation and their leaders. And then verse 15, it was some of the basics of interpersonal relationships in the body of Christ. But the commands of verse 16 through 22 have more to do with our individual spiritual lives and our relationship to God. So what does God want us to be in 2022? What does God want us to do in 2022? These verses will give us, I think, a good start in discovering that. But first notice that the things mentioned in these verses, beginning with uh, verse 16, have a lot to do with our attitudes. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstance, for this is God's, the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. These are very personal things, very individual things that have to do with the way we look at life, our outlook on life. We might do all the right things, but have the wrong attitudes. Like the boy who was made to sit in the corner, who mumbled to himself, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. It's, what on the, it's on, what's on the inside that counts most. And Paul points to several key things here which will lead to right behavior and doing what God wants us to do in 2022. First of all, God wants us to be people of constant joy. That's what he says, isn't it? Rejoice always. Joy is a positive outlook based on our confidence in God. Joy is not necessarily the same thing as happiness. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6.10 that he was uh, sorrowful but always rejoicing. Doesn't that seem like a paradox or a, what's the other word for that? Yeah, an oxymoron, thank you. Happiness has to do with pleasurable feelings, but joy relates to an inner disposition. Happiness is dependent on our circumstances, but joy is not. Sorrow is not the opposite of joy. We can be sorrowful and have joyful at the same time. Despair is the opposite of joy. So you say, illustrate, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I couldn't think of any illustration any better than a funeral for a Christian. Are people there sorrowful? But do they have joy? Yeah. We got that inner disposition, that outlook, based in our confidence in God, even in the midst of the sorrow that we feel. We are instructed to have joy always. Is that realistic? Is that possible? It is. It's only possible if we focus our attention on God's promises. We have to look beyond our circumstances. We have a God who has a good purpose for us in spite of of our circumstances. You know the verse, Romans 8, 28.
which says, and we know, that for those who love God, all things will work together for good. That's for our eternal good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So, the first thing we know that God wants us to do in 2022 is be a people of constant joy. But also, God wants us to be a people of prayer. Verse 17. It's pretty simple. Pray without ceasing. Now, Paul is not talking about nonstop prayer. That's impossible. I mean, if you have a job and you have to use your mind in your job, you have to be thinking about what you're doing, don't you? But what Paul is talking about is prayer as a habitual aspect of our lives, a realization of the continual presence of God with us, living in conversation with God. Scheduled times of prayer are good, but Paul here has in mind one who spontaneously punctuates his daily life with prayer, with conversations with God which go on throughout the day. There's an old book. I don't know if you've read it, but it's worthwhile reading. It was entitled, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. I don't think it's striking a bell with too many people. <laughs> if you haven't read it, it's worthwhile. He was a monk back, I don't know, 1400s or 1300s. But uh, This idea that all life, all we go through our day, is a continual conversation with God. And God wants us to be thankful people. Verse 18, it says... Give thanks in all circumstances. Thankfulness carries two ideas. The first idea is an attitude of the heart, a heart that's filled with gratitude to God. The second is the expression of that gratitude in words. And they go together. If your heart is filled with gratitude, your words will express it. People will hear it when you talk. The hard part of this command is a little phrase, in all circumstances. Ephesians 5.20 is even harder. Uh, we'll uh, bypass that one for now. <laughs> but does God... Expect us to be happy about everything we experience? Is God expecting us to be thankful that a two-year-old got cancer and died? Or that a young man with a wife and a small children dies in an auto accident? No. But in every situation, no matter how terrible and distasteful, the experience may be there's always something for which to give thanks. I read this uh, story. There was a great Bible commentator several hundred years ago named Matthew Henry. And a man once stole Matthew Henry's wallet, robbed him, knocked him off his horse, and took his wallet. In reflecting on this incident, Henry said this, I'm thankful that he never robbed me before. <laughs> I'm thankful that although he took my wallet, he did not take my life. And although he took all I had, I'm thankful it wasn't much. <laughs> and finally, I'm glad that I was the one who was robbed and not the one who did the robbing. Be thankful in all circumstances. The last part of verse 18 is somewhat unclear. He says, uh, 
for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So as good students of grammar, we see the word this, and we must ask what? What does it refer to? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. It could refer to the circumstances. Give thanks for these circumstances are God's will for you. Um, the circumstances are part of God's plan for us, at least what he permitted. Um, or it could also mean this could refer to being thankful. Be thankful for this is God's will for you, to be thankful. Both are true, aren't they? The third thing that God wants us to be and do in this new year is God wants us to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Anybody, anybody here campers? We got some campers? All right. So what's the last thing you're supposed to do at the end of the day before you go to sleep? Put the fire out, right? You take a pail of water and you, you sizzle. You're putting that campfire out. Well, that's what this word means, quench. It means don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't turn your back on what the Spirit of God wants to accomplish in your life. Don't turn a deaf ear to what the Spirit is saying to you. The Spirit of God speaks to us through the Bible. He speaks to us through our conscience. He teaches. He guides. He convicts. But I had a question that came to my mind as I read this and studied this. How do we know if the prompting or conviction we feel is from the Holy Spirit or it is just something manufactured in our own minds? Let me suggest that we could ask a couple of questions first. Is this prompting based on biblical truth? And the second question to ask, is this prompting something affirmed by other believers who know us well in the Bible well. We have to be careful. Some believers say and do things that they think God told them to say or do when he didn't. But we need to be open. Open before God to listen to what the Spirit of God is saying through his word and through our conscience. The fourth thing God wants us to do God wants us to be responsive to the ministry of the word of God to us by other believers. Verse 20 and 21 says, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. In these verses, Paul addresses the ministry which takes place as believers gather together and God speaks to us through other believers. One way we could be tempted to quench the Spirit would be to treat prophecies with contempt, to reject what God is saying was saying to his prophets. Now, there's a great debate about prophecy among evangelicals. Is God still giving the spiritual gift of prophecy or not? Now, I'm not going to address that, this, this, that this, uh, debate this morning, but you can ask me about it later. But the most thorough teaching on that subject I've ever read is from Wayne Grudem in his Systematic Theology. I don't know if you've been introduced to that by Pastor Ty or not. But, uh, check it out. But beyond the debate, I want to go beyond the debate. We can all agree that what Paul is saying is that when your fellow believers in church speak to you about matters about which they believe God has prompted them to speak, don't automatically reject what they are saying. Whether it's just conversation among yourselves or what the pastor is preaching or the Sunday school teacher is, is teaching, listen carefully. 
Paul says to put everything to the test. If what is said to you accords with the Bible, it's true, it's helpful, pay attention to it, respond to it. Be open to what God may be telling you through the ministry of others, but be wise and discerning. If what they say is biblically unsound or unhelpful, put it aside. I'm reminded of what Luke said about the people of Berea in Acts 17. He said they examined the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. And I think that's the attitude we should have about everything a teacher or a pastor uh, or a professor, whoever says. Don't be close-minded or hard-hearted, but be discerning. We need to be. Out there in the world, there's a lot of stuff that's not necessarily true or helpful. So. All right, and then finally, God wants us to keep away from sin. That seems pretty clear you, that God would want that, doesn't it? That's what he says. Abstain from every form of evil. It is our responsibility to turn away from anything that is wrong or is evil. No exceptions. I decided that uh, this year I'm going to watch what I eat a little better. I don't know how long that commitment will last. But, uh, I want to be in shape when the running season comes so I can beat Doug again. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, so the first temptation will be, well, exceptions. You know, it's, it, it, the Hawkeyes, excuse me, I'm an Iowa fan, the Hawkeyes won a game, so I should be able to celebrate, shouldn't I? <laughs> except they lost yesterday. <laughs> so anyway, no exceptions. Every kind of evil should be avoided, whether in thought or words or actions. So, let's put this all together. Do we want to be what God wants us to be this year and do what he wants us to do? Then we need to develop Attitudes of joy at all times, constant prayerfulness, and thankfulness in all circumstances. Do we want our lives to be filled with joy and prayer and gratitude? Then we must not close our hearts to the work of God's Spirit. He is working through the ministry of others to us. Now, our hopes and dreams for 2022 may not be fulfilled. But we can become more of what God wants us to be and do more of what God wants us to do by walking in dependent obedience, our hearts open to the prompting of His Spirit and our ears open to the ministry of one another. One final word. I don't know. Perhaps you decided to start this new year by become, coming to church for the first time. I don't know. Or maybe it's the first time in many years. If so, welcome. Our purpose as a church is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel and becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. The first step in becoming a disciple of Jesus is to trust him as your savior from sin. Jesus, God the Son, came to this earth to die on the cross in payment for our sins. And the Bible tells us that if we acknowledge our sin and place our trust in Jesus, he will give us eternal life. He will forgive our sin. And we will begin a life of following Jesus 
as his disciple. We have a prayer to pray together. Uh, maybe he kind of puts this all together by a prayer. So let's pray this together. Lord, we know that our lives are in your hands and that though we will not accomplish everything we would like, what matters is what you want us to do. Our God, enable us to develop the attitudes of joy at all times, constant prayerfulness, and thankfulness in all circumstances. Give us willing hearts to sense the promptings of your spirit and discern what is from you and what is not. Grant us open ears to receive the words of teaching, encouragement, and admonition from our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Help us to turn away from every kind of evil. We acknowledge and praise you that you are at work in us to conform us to the character of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that you will indeed establish us blameless in holiness before 